Good evening, good evening, good evening. Give praise and honor to God who doeth all things well. I pray and trust everything has been going well for you. And God has been keeping and sustaining you. And then just renewing your strength and your faith and trust in him. I pray that God has been blessing you in that regard immensely. <clears throat> now, before we get started, let us keep in mind all of those on our prayer list. Um, uh, Asia Lee and her husband, Miranda Porter's daughter for the recovery of her surgery. And um, before we close... Um, We'll put the information on the screen behind me uh, concerning Sister Carolyn Bush's nephew, the funeral um, viewing and all of that information that was given to us. So we'll have that on the screen for you. Uh, keep, again, Sister Gwen Bryan in your prayers, Mary Williams in your prayers. Keep our teachers and faculty in prayer concerning the school and, and the students also because I, I there are many not only going back to uh, elementary, middle, and high school, but we've got college students also who will have to make the decision to go to school or to, to, uh, to do it virtually or to enter into the physical building of the school. So pray for our college students as well. Um, keep Sister Katrina Hall, Urban Thomas, Sister Green uh, in your prayers. So keep all of those mentioned in, uh, in your prayers and many others who will who are standing in need of prayer uh, Travis is uh, back he is all of his tests came back uh, negative concerning the virus and concerning anything else he is doing uh, much better so he's upstairs um, working the sound system so praise God for that praise God for brother Garvin Kawisi who is, uh, his test came back negative, and so he's doing much better. As a matter of fact, he's already back to work, so let's just continue to pray that God will be magnified in all of this and glorified in all of this um, because of his power, because of his grace, and because of his, his mercy. Well, now we've started a study that we've launched out of uh, what we call theologically uh, eschatology, and that is we are looking systematically at the study of the end times. And now we launched into the study of the end times, uh, a, a particular study, just before we get into the second coming of Jesus, we launched into a particular study that has to do with life after death, and what happens to man when he dies. And why is that important? I think um, the church has become so desensitized by the world that we no longer talk about life after death. We, we don't really talk about the soul of man, per se. We don't really talk about hell. Um, you know, I've been in some arenas where hell is offensive to people. Um, where we talk about hell is just is, it, it, it's harsh on the, the hearer. Well, if we don't talk about what Jesus talked about, if we don't talk, talk about the realities of hell, then we will have we will lead a people astray. We will lead a people down a path of where they believe that there are no consequences for ungodliness. And that's dangerous. Um, and my thing is, you can't believe in heaven and not believe in a hell prepared for the devil and his angels. And so to cancel out one is to cancel out the other. If there is no hell, then there can't be any heaven. If there is no heaven, then there is no purpose really for us to live on earth. And so uh, let us be mindful of that. Let us keep our minds uh, on that. And really... Uh, look at hell as a reality but from the standpoint of why we need to save the sinner from the error of his ways because there are a lot of people dying amongst us and they have no idea they had no idea that hell was real i listened to a sermon uh, many years ago uh, from the parable of the rich man and lazarus called hell is truth seen too late and that is absolutely true 
What a tragedy for a man to wake up in hell and see the truth and the reality of it too late. Well, we've been talking about the consciousness of man. We've looked at uh, some things concerning uh, hell and the translations of hell. Uh, it can be translated Hades. It can be translated Tartarus, the place where sinners go and they are held there until the second coming of the Lord. Then we talked about in a little bit of Gehenna hell. Gehenna hell is the final place where sinners will go and receive everlasting torment and punishment for their ungodliness or their unwillingness to give their life to Jesus Christ. And so I, I made that in a point to bring out to you because some people um, either when they teach this or when you read it, you'll come away with a misunderstanding that the word hell, every time you see the word hell, it automatically means hell fire, and that's not the case. Now, let us look at a parable in Luke chapter 16. Let us look at a parable in Luke chapter 16. And... Begin at verse number 19. Jesus, as he gives this parable, says, Now there was a rich man, and he habitually dressed in purple and fine linen, and joyously living in splendor every day. Or another translation says, and he fed sumptuously every day. And a poor man named Lazarus was laid at his gate, covered with sores, longing to be fed with the crumbs which were falling from the rich man's table. Besides, even the dogs were coming and licking his sores. And now the poor man died and was carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades he lifted up his eyes, being in torment saw Abraham be uh, far off and Lazarus in his bosom. He cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus so that he may dip the tip of his finger in water, cool off my tongue, for I am in agony in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your life you received good things and likewise Lazarus received bad things. Now he is uh, being comforted here, and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you, there is a great chasm or a great gulf fixed, so that those who wish to come over from here to you will not be able, and that none may cross over from there to us. And he said then, I beg you, Father, that you send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, and in, uh, uh, in order that they may warn them, he may warn them, so that they will not also come to this place of torment. But Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. He said, no, Father Abraham, but if someone goes uh, to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will, not be pers they will not be persuaded, even if someone rises from the dead. Now, notice, we've been, we've been discussing uh, not only uh, where man goes when he dies, but we've been also looking at uh, whether or not Man is totally annihilated, that is, that he, or that he is completely destroyed when he dies, that he is unaware, he's not conscious of, of what's going on, he doesn't feel anything, um, or whether or not there is this such thing as purgatory where the priest can pray you out of uh, uh, this temporary holding place where God purges you of your sins and then you usher into heaven. Uh, is that really true? Uh, well, after you paid money, can, can those living pay money to the priest 
so that they can ensure that their souls will be purged in purgatory so that they can make it into heaven. Is that the Bible? Does the Bible teach that? Well, notice something. There was a rich man, Jesus gives the parable, there was a rich man and there was a, a poor man by the name of Lazarus. Now in, in chapter 16, verse 14, you remember the, the Jesus, the Bible says the Pharisees were lovers of money. And so they often were scoffing at uh, what Jesus would do and his, his dealing with uh, publicans and sinners, the common folk. But they, the heart of them was that they love money. Now, I used to read this, and oftentimes I would think uh, that the man ended up in hell because he was wealthy or because he simply did not um, feed or give uh, Lazarus who was in need. Well, the more I studied it, the more I realized that those were simply symptoms to a bigger problem. The more the real problem was that this rich man did not take heed to the word of God. He failed to live by the word of God. He lived under the law. Here he is under the law. He failed to live by what the Bible says or the law says, treating thy neighbor as thyself. He failed to realize how God saw that they were to take care of the needs of the needy. He failed to, real, to live by the word of God. And when he failed to live by the word of God, he, diso he disobeyed the word of God. And when you disobey the word of God, it is but to disobey God. So his problem, the, the not giving Lazarus the crumbs that fell from his table was really symptoms. His real issue was the word. Now we may just see or pull out that we know he knew the word and he knew better, but he just didn't do it. Now notice, Jesus says, this man was dressed in purple and fine linen. And the NASB says, he did this habitually. <laughs> just caught when, when he got up to eat breakfast, he dressed this way. It was overkill. When he went to eat lunch, he was dressed. He got himself overly dressed to display his wealth and his royalty. When he ate dinner, he was dressed. It's like wearing a tuxedo to dinner or to lunch or to breakfast. This was this man. He dressed this way. He, was, he joyously lived in his splendor and his good living. He was the man on top. He had it all. He had nothing to want for, except he was lacking spiritually. He had everything physically, but he was dead and empty spiritually. Now watch it. Poor man named Lazarus, verse 20, was laid at his gate, and cover up with, with sores, longing to be fed with the crumbs which were falling from the rich man's table, and besides, even the dogs were coming to lick his sword. So now, here is a man, we've got two men, one wealthy, one who lived in the splendor of his wealth, one who fed sumptuously, and then when you, when you read this, fed sumptuously, this is, this man didn't just eat a plate of food, this man had a feast that was prepared for him every day. He had an abundance of food to eat every single day. And here is Lazarus laid providentially at his gate, begging and wanting simply just the crumbs. This man is full of sores. He is sick. We can even infer that he's dying because of his health. And Lazarus turned, uh, and the rich man turns a blind eye. But now, what we're going to see, something that is even more condemning for this rich man, is that when I read the text, when I read all of it, I begin to realize that this rich man knew Lazarus because he'll call him by his name. <laughs> Watch this. It says, longing to be fed 
from the crumbs which were falling from this man's rich man's table, the dogs were coming to lick his sword. Now, I've heard sometimes we as preachers, we, we've used this to say the nurses were the, were the only ones who, the dogs were the nurses who cared for him. But you got to understand during Bible times, dogs like this were not nurses, they were scavengers. Uh, they, they, they sensed that this man was actually dying and they were ready to, to, uh, they were ready to take advantage of his death, if you will, if I'm, so that I don't become so gory with this. But these dogs weren't nursing him. These dogs were ready for something else. And his situation was so bad that you see the difference between the rich man's life and this poor man's life. But now notice how death becomes the equalizer. He says, now the poor man, in verse 22, the poor man died and was carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom, which is a metaphor for, for peace and rest. Uh, carried to Abraham's bosom. Rich man also died and was buried. Now you remember earlier, I, when we started the lesson, I told you man is made of a body, soul, and spirit. That is the body uh, that holds the soul of man, That the, the soul being that which uh, is the seat of his emotions, his thoughts, his thinking, his consciousness, the who, his will, who that man really is. That's the soul of man. The spirit which gives breath to us, to, that we can inhale and exhale, goes back to God at death. The body is then buried. But then... What we see next is something else that lives on, and that's the man's soul. So and that's what we've been harping on on this lesson. Is man conscious when he dies, or is he just oblivious to anything? Is he just sleep, as some teach? We're going to see that this man is fully aware of what is going on around him. Now, it says, in Hades, he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and he saw Abraham. Now notice, if this man was simply asleep, then he would not have ever lifted up his eyes. If this man was simply annihilated, then how could he see Abraham afar off? And then the fact to know Abraham uh, is but to signify what he also knows about the law. Notice, uh, and, and history that records even his forefathers. It says he saw Abraham far away and Lazarus in his bosom. He cried, the rich man, cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus so that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool off my tongue, for I am in agony, watch this, in this flame. Now notice, he then says, I, Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he may come and dip his, his finger in water and cool my tongue. Notice, even in hell, his disposition towards Lazarus had changed. His attitude, his thinking, still is the same. You would think that someone in this type of situation would have rather be a servant instead of Lazarus serving him. When all the while he had time on earth to serve Lazarus. He had time on earth to do right by Lazarus. He had time on earth to do good in the sight of God and he didn't do it. Now all of a sudden he finds himself in torment. He finds himself in agony. This, this way he finds himself, this part of Hades is Tatar. He finds himself there, and now he, he has the audacity to ask Lazarus to come and cool his tongue. Notice what Abraham says. Abraham says, but, but uh, child, remember that during your life, you receive your good things and likewise, Lazarus, bad things. Now he is being comforted here, and you are in agony. Do you remember what Jesus said to the thief on the cross? Today you shall be with me in paradise. 
Uh, and that's, that's the picture of where the Christian goes. Those faithful to the Lord Jesus, when they die, they are being comforted there. They are, being, they are at rest there. And, you know, the beauty of that for the child of God is that they are, the one thing they are oblivious to is what is going on in the world that they left behind. None of that stuff matters because now they are, they are in the presence of God. They are, they are in a peaceful state. They are at rest. They are being comforted and cared for. What a glorious picture that, look, that, that the Christian can look forward to when he or she dies in the Lord. What a, what a powerful thing to know that while I might be tormented on this earth by Satan and the devil or uh, his, his, his angels and all of the enemies uh, toward anything good, while I may suffer in this time, when God calls me home, none of that will be no law. All of that will be ended. It will come to an end. It will be no more. Uh, you and I will have ultimate comfort, peace, and tranquility that only resides in Jesus Christ. No more tears to shed. No more, no more worry about tomorrow. Uh, no more pain of being um, uh, used and abused. No more, no more being betrayed. No more, no more of the ills of the world. No longer will I be worried about uh, the. the Racist overtones that are being purported during our time. None of that stuff will be in our midst when we are with the Lord. What a powerful picture. This man is comforted. He, he was in pain on earth, but now he's at peace in the Hadean world. Well, he says, remember, you had the good things and, and Lazarus had bad things, but now he's being comforted. Besides this, now watch verse 26. It says, besides all this, between us and you, there is a great chasm fixed so that those who wish to come over from here to you will not be able and that none may cross over from there to us. And so and this dispels this notion of purgatory and that you'll be able you end up as a sinner you die but once per the, 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 the duration of purgatory is over you now go into heaven on the other side no what Jesus is pointing out to the disciples and the Pharisees who are listening in about this parable is that listen when you die your destination is fixed where you go next has, is already de determined. How you live on earth now will determine where you end up later. There ain't no coming across and there ain't no uh, intermediate state. There ain't no, there ain't a gospel that will be preached. I heard that where, where uh, those who die, in the, die as a sinner, well, when Jesus comes, there's going to be a, a period where he'll preach to those of souls and then they can obey the gospel. No. No. That's far into the Bible. When a man dies, I think the Hebrew writer says at once it is appointed, once it is appointed unto man to die and after this, death is judgment. So he waits the sentencing, his final sentencing from the Lord. So uh, they're in a purgatory. They're in, they're in a God, a second gospel that will be preached. What we have right now is more than enough to keep you and I out of hell and to save the world from eternal damnation. The word of God is sufficient. It's effective. All we have to do is preach it and teach it. So he says to them, he says, there is a great chasm fixed so that those who wish to come over from here to you will not be able and that none may cross over from there to us. He said then, I beg you, Father, that you send him to my father's house. For I have five brothers. 
in order that they may warn, he may warn them so that they will not also come to this place of torment. Think about this now. Now, evangelism is on his mind. When evangelism should have been the thing he was taking care of while on earth. As a matter of fact, he should have taken the funds and his, his splendorous living to fund an evangelistic effort. He should have been taking his finances to help fund the apostles' ministry or, or, or some other disciples' ministry to save the world from the error of their ways. But guess what? He sees evangelism too late. And he wants them to warn his brothers not to come to this place. That's why I tell you, there, once a man dies and leaves this earth, there isn't anybody on earth who can mediate for them and tell you what they are saying. There ain't anybody, there's no soothsayer, so save your money, do not buy into that foolishness, and it's a, it, is, it is an abomination to God for you to, 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 to solicit people to try to talk to the dead. When you die, that is all. There isn't anything else left. You are with God or you are with you are waiting with the devil and his or the, those disobedience in the Hadean world. Now, he says something else. But Abraham said, they have <laughs> Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. Now you got to remember, when Abraham says this to them, they don't have the New Testament and the, the Old and the New Testament as a Bible the way we have it. All they had at that time was the Old Testament and the law. So when he tells them they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. He's saying the word that God has provided for them so that they don't come to where you are is more than enough. They have the word of God. They have what can keep them, the only thing that can keep them away from this place. He says, so let them hear them. But watch the response. He says, but no, Father Abraham, if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. Underscore that. They will repent. Now, where would he get such thinking from about repentance? It could only come from what he knows concerning the law. It could only come from what he knows about the sin and trespass offer. It can only come from what he knows about having a contrite heart and a broken spirit before God. He knows the word of God. He knew the word of God. Else he wouldn't have talked about sending his brothers to do somebody to do evangelism to them. Or else he would not have brought up sending someone so that their brothers could repent. Notice, he said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced or persuaded even if someone rises from the dead. Even if someone rises from the dead. Notice how, notice how Abraham uh, puts that on the heart of this rich man. He says, there is one who is going to die. And there is one who will be the savior of this world. And, and he will be raised from amongst the dead. The problem is, there will be some, just like your brothers, who still will not believe. And do you not know that's, the, that's what's going on today? You have skeptics. You have people who, uh, who discredit Christianity. People who call it a myth or that it's a borrowed myth. People who say Jesus didn't really uh, exist or walk this earth. There are a whole lot of people who find it hard to believe that Jesus is real. But I read what Jesus would say in John 12, 48. He that rejecteth me and receives not my word has one that judges him. The same words 
just like Moses and the prophets, the same words that he speaks will judge a man in the last days. What a privilege it is for us to have right now on this time side of earth to be able to hear the word and to be able to obey the word. That's what's most important, my friend. It ain't always about you getting your shower on. It ain't always about you having church. What it's about is whether or not you are getting fed the word of God so that it can save your soul. So that it can, it can, it, it can, it can engraft in your heart so that you can be more Christ-like. So that you can be fit for heaven and ready when the Lord comes again. That's what this is about. So what does that challenge us to do who will say? Tell everybody, like the rich man wanted, tell everybody we know who doesn't know Jesus not to come to this place. And that's, what, that's, what, that's what's in front of us. That's what challenges us. That's why following Jesus is so, so important. Listen, I pray you study. We're going to study Matthew chapter 25 next. But I pray that this has helped you. But what we are studying uh, is what happens to man after he dies. We look at some of, some other language from Matthew 25, and we're going to talk about that a little bit. Um, there's more, so much more that can be said in this, this passage. And I preached it here at Liberty City. Um, but just, just know him, him ending up where he ended up was really a, a byproduct of what his real issue was, and that was his failure to adhere to the word of God. Listen, uh, keep these, I've got a, uh, another prayer list that I want you to keep the Katina Daniels family in your prayer. Uh, her dad's only sister is in serious condition in the hospital after having a heart attack, and she lives in Macon, Georgia. That's the sister of uh, Brother Larry Daniels Sr., I also uh, keep um, their family, all of their family in your prayers as they meet with the doctors on tomorrow concerning what they have to do. Um, so the information concerning Sister Carolyn Bush, uh, her nephew, I hope you can see it, is on the board, it's on the screen. Um, and so we'll also, we'll have Travis also post that on, on Facebook, on our Facebook page, so that you can see that. But uh, let's keep Sister Carolyn Bush, Sheree Warner, all of them in your prayers, and all of those, uh, Ronnie Miles family, many others um, who stand in need of prayer. You know, I, as the older folk used to always say, you know, when, when trouble hits, that just simply means there's always something we got to pray for. There's always a reason for prayer. And so let us join me in prayer as we go to our Father uh, who sits upon the throne. Our great God and Savior, we are so thankful for you being our God. We're thankful for the study of your word. We thank you, Father, for your grace and your mercy. We thank you for your holiness and for your willingness to send your Son as a part of your divine scheme of redemption to save us from our sin. Father, we pray and ask that you continue to bless all of those who are on our prayer list, dear God, that are in need of prayer, that have family members that they have to meet with doctors to make decisions about, that, Father, those who, um, who are right now not at the best of health, we pray, dear God, that through your power, through your will, that you will heal them and restore them to their health. We pray, Heavenly Father, that as we are careful to give you thanks and praise for blessing those who have overcome illnesses, for those who have, in this pandemic, been able to receive jobs and, and means of ways to take care of themselves. Father, we thank you for that. Father, we ask your blessings on our school teachers and faculty, our college instructors, and the students. Father, keep them safe, and then, Father, crown these leaders with wisdom so that they will see the bigger picture, and that is the well-being of the life and safety of all involved. And Father, we pray that uh, you help us to live uh, more alert lives, more sober lives, so that we will always have in the forefront of our mind the second coming of your Son. Help us to realize, Father, that hell is just as a much a reality as heaven itself. 
Help us to realize, Father, and give us the empowerment to share with others uh, the gospel news so that they will not come to that place. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for what you're doing through us all. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.